if we haven't met before. I'd love to get to know you if we haven't met. Um, but we're going to open up like we usually do with very exciting announcements. Uh, so a couple of them are reminders, and then we do have one new one. So first up is coming up this Saturday, which is the 20th, at 8 a.m., we are having a men's breakfast. So that's at 8 o'clock here at the church, men's breakfast. If you would like to contribute something to the meal and bring it along, you can connect with Ben Tracy, uh, and that way uh, you can figure out what we need for the menu. And then directly following that, starting at 9 a.m., give or take, is going to be a, a work day. We're going to have both indoor and outdoor projects. Probably the indoor projects, you know who you are if you're going to be part of those ones, um, because I think there's a very particular plan on what's going on in the personage basement apartment. That's a mouthful. Uh, and then there's also going to be some outdoor projects, just refreshing the church property now that all the snow has melted, for sure, probably. Um, <laughs> and then uh, next week, we have something really cool, uh, a guy named London Beachy. I don't know if you guys have met Allie. Um, if you haven't, she's pretty cool. And her little brother is coming next week. And when I say little brother, he's a teenager, and he is going to be doing some international missions this coming summer. So it's a really cool thing that uh, such a young guy is going to be a part of. And so he's going to be sharing about his ministry and inviting us to be a part of that, whether that means we just join his prayer team and he also has some financial needs that we can be a part of. So that's something just to be considering for next week. He's going to come share about what particularly he is doing. Um, but he's a really great guy, really loves the Lord, and this opportunity he has is really awesome. So uh, just be thinking about that as it comes up. Uh, but otherwise, we are going to pray together, and then we are going to sing some songs to the Lord. God, thank you for this church. Thank you for every person that's in here and for the plans that you have for our lives. Uh, God, you are not uh, just uninvolved in your creation, but Lord, in every moment, even this one, you are very mindful in how you work. And so, God, we just want to think of you this morning as we sing songs. I pray that you would encourage us and uplift us and challenge us to keep moving forward in faith. And God, I pray that your word would just work in power today. It says that uh, it will never return void and will always accomplish what you want it to. And I pray that would be something we see today in our own lives and in our hearts. And so, God, we commit ourselves to you in this service and our praise to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can stand. Let's just sing. Oh, in Jesus. 
God, you are a faithful God to your people. Uh, Lord, we can read through the scriptures how you've always been faithful to your chosen people. And God, we uh, stand amazed that you would choose to graft us into your uh, children, that you would adopt those that call in the name of Jesus, and that you would be our our father uh, for the rest of our lives and throughout eternity. God, I pray that you would um, just take this next block of time as we open your word. Uh, God, first of all, we ask that you'd receive the praise we gave you. And God, in the next uh, bit that you would... Uh, just guide our time together. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be the teacher in the room. Uh, God, that each person here would have a word from uh, their God when they leave, uh, Lord Jesus, whether that is a, a word of encouragement, whether that is a word of correction, whether that is a word of um, come to me and and I will give you rest, Lord. I pray that you just speak to people uh, where they're at and what they need to hear and that you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are going to continue to go through uh, the book of Matthew, which we've been going through uh, for the past several months, and we took a two-week break for Easter and then for last week, and then we're back on track with Matthew chapter 17. So if you have a pew Bible, which I've always been curious, why do they call them pews? But anyways, uh, I digress. Uh, in, in the pew Bibles, the page 1045 is where we'll be at if you are not familiar with the Bible very much. I hope you find it. If you are familiar, it is the book of Matthew uh, chapter 17. We'll be talking about the transfiguration of Jesus. So if you don't know what that is, uh, I will teach you what that is, hopefully. Um, but uh, have you ever, by way of opening question, have you ever been, gone into a situation expecting one thing and later on you're sitting there wondering what the heck just happened? Like either what the heck just happened, this is really cool, or what the heck just happened, the bottom fell out. Um, I was in a few situations uh, like that recently. This past Wednesday, I thought I would be a super pastor, and so I came in, and Tuesday night, the uh, youth group met for a movie night in the gym, and so they had a 20-foot screen set up, and they had all sorts of snacks, and so there was you know, goo and chocolate and all kinds of stuff all over the floor in the gym. The next morning, they picked up about half the stuff, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to come in. I'm here a little bit early. I'm going to have everything cleaned and mopped, and they're going to come in and say, wow, what a great pastor. Uh, That didn't happen uh, because I went ahead and swept in the gym and then started putting uh, food away and wrappers away and took the garbage out, and I'm like, yeah, this is so great. I'm doing doing such a great job. And then uh, I ran a mop bucket of water, and then uh, it overflowed the mop bucket of water in the sink. And as I was coming into the kitchen, I noticed just a little bit of water on the floor, and I thought, I must have spilled that. 
And then all of a sudden, both doors underneath the sink opened up. And there must have been like an inch of water in there that had been collecting over the past, I don't know how many weeks. And it all flowed out onto my feet. So when Jacob came in 10 minutes later, I am soaking wet and I'm on the floor with towels and uh, actually it was just paper towels at that time. Paper towels all wet all over the floor. I'm trying to fix the kitchen sink. Apparently what had happened is somebody put something away, knocked the, the, tr the water trap underneath the P-trap underneath the sink loose. And so water was absolutely everywhere. Jacob walks in and he's like, I need a hand there, Ryan. I'm like, I was trying to be a good, but it didn't work. And I just, and I'm standing there and sort of like I had not bargained for this moment. Or uh, those of you that are getting ready to get married, here's a free change for you. I had, I have a couple rules when I lead a, a wedding rehearsal that it's the night before. And so that's rule number one. It's the night before. Uh, so that everybody's fresh, they know what to do for the wedding rehearsal. Uh, number two, I lead it, and I usually have an assistant that helps me to lead it. Uh, number three, no mother-in-laws. And, um, and then number four, uh, I have to have the music people there. So those are kind of my, here's what we want. If we want to have a successful wedding, we'll do this. And I had been invited to go out of state and, and lead a wedding, and it was the largest wedding I'd ever led. Like, I had not uh, led a, a very large one. This was hundreds and hundreds of people, and they had rented a whole hall, and so lots of money had been poured into this, this wedding, and so the, the pressure's on, and we get to the rehearsal, and they're like, don't worry about our music guy. Uh, he is a professional, professional DJ, and so he was out late last night. He's out again tonight. Won't be able to be there for the rehearsal, and I'm like, that is rule number four, and you broke it, and we got there, and they're like, no, this guy's professional. So we, we get there the next day, and he's sitting off to the left so we can make eye contact with each other, and I can nod to him. He can nod to me, and he's got this super fancy iPad hooked up to the sound system, and the prelude music went really well. It was gentle. It was just what the people had picked, and the ladies walk down the aisle, and they stand up. The guys were already there. Things are going great, and then everything stops. And the first thing that we do is the, uh, the groom and I step down one step, and then I say, all rise. And so we step down one step. We said, all rise. And we can see the bride's nose just crest the door in the back of the room. And the loudest booty bopping, inappropriate music <laughs> blares over the whole place. I wanted to crawl in a hole and die only after killing the guy with the iPad, right? So uh, he's looking at me, and he's got this panicked look on his face. I'm like, you probably should. I mean, you know, no joke, but the bride was an athlete, and her husband's an athlete, so, you know, he really doesn't stand a chance. He couldn't even outrun them if he wanted to. But I'm looking at it, and it's just one of those situations where, you know, again, I didn't bargain for this, and I'm in the situation, right? Can happen good, can happen bad. Some of you have been in that spot here or there, but... Uh, we can have the best intentions. We can have the best plan. We can even have the best rhythms of life to where we think we know what's coming next, and yet God still drops a bomb at certain moments, and it, it really drops our jaw. Luke gives us, so this is, uh, as we approach Matthew 17, the transfiguration, there are three of the gospel writers that wrote the, about the transfiguration. So from three different views, uh, we see the transfiguration, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So those are synoptic gospels. Everybody say synoptic. Synoptic. <laughs> All right. So that just means that those are a lot, uh, a lot more similar than the book of John. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, they all three write about the transfiguration. And as they do, they add different uh, details Luke adds some of those at the beginning that helps set up the scene. Okay, so here's what Luke says about the beginning. He says that they are going up on a mountain to pray, and they were praying. Okay, so before we, uh, you know, as we are approaching the text, we can know that the intention, the normal rhythm, what was expected was we are going up on this mountaintop, and we are going to pray. And Jesus brings along uh, Peter, James, and John to do that. And so it was a regular rhythm. They believed they knew what was going to happen next. And God threw them sort of a curveball. And it was also that they can get a deeper glimpse 
of God's glory. If we could all grasp that when God throws us curveballs, it oftentimes, if not every time, is to get you to a point where you see God more glorified than you did the day before. That if we could look at the messes that we see or this change up that happens and say, wow, this is so I can meet my God in a deeper way than last time. That's why I'm maybe going through this is so that I can see God high and lifted up. Enough about that, enough background. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 17, uh, verses 1 through 8. So again, 1045 in the Pew Bibles. If you're a guest or you just don't have a Bible at home or you lost it or gave it to somebody else, feel free to take one of those Bibles with you if you don't have one uh, moving forward and that can become your Bible. Those are a free gift to you. So Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him, and Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Sorry, I forgot to switch the slide for those of you that were following along. Uh, they saw no one but Jesus only. So here's what we're going to do over the next few minutes together. Uh, we will, by few, I mean several, uh, we are going to go ahead and walk through the verses. And instead of giving a big wrap up at the end with application, we're just going to do application as we go. So got four points for you. So if you're a note taker, one, two, three, four down the left side of your piece of paper or wherever you like to take notes. So let's navigate the first couple verses together. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. This is an important note. Uh, Jesus has his three guys, and he generally will take these guys. They will also be in the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus. And it is not abnormal for Jesus to seemingly favor these three guys, although there are some commentators that say the reason Jesus took them was because uh, James and John uh, argued about who is the greatest, and Peter was in a spot where he was actually uh, rebuking Jesus, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, right before this scene. So some people think it's because they're favored. Other people think it's because they're dumb, and they just don't get it. So uh, Jesus goes with these, uh, uh, with Jesus, sorry, the disciples go with Jesus, and Jesus is transfigured before them. So these guys are praying, and they are uh, praying maybe fervently, I don't know, but they have walked with Jesus. They're expecting to be people that are praying with Jesus. As they are praying, Jesus is transfigured before them. He is fully transformed. This is Jesus in a glorified state right before them. And Matthew says uh, that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light, right? So they're just praying, and all of a sudden, they felt this gleam of light and maybe opened one eye and opened two eyes, and oh my goodness, Jesus is glowing right in front of them. Two other, uh, the other two gospel writers share it like this. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. We're not sure why, but as this was recorded, Peter was thinking of doing laundry. So, uh, but he said, this was literally what the text says. And then Luke records that as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And so this idea of radiant that Luke talks about uh, or that is, that is written uh, in the text, the, the radiant light that was seen uh, is like a flash of lightning. So Jesus is completely changed completely transformed. This is Jesus not wearing practice sweats. This is Jesus at game time. It is as if his humanity could not hold his divine nature. So Jesus uh, in this moment is completely transformed from who he normally would be. And like a fat man wearing skinny jeans, his glory bursted forth and overflowed his humanity for just a moment. 
Uh, the writer of Hebrews writes this. This about, this about Jesus. He, being Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He's saying this Jesus is more than what you assume that he is. When you see Jesus walking in the flesh to these people in this time, as they saw Jesus walking in the flesh, they probably got to a point where they thought, he's just another man just like us, right? He's got some sort of superpowers that we see every once in a while, but lest they forget that he is the radiance of the glory of God. So everything that is glorifying about God, everything that makes God radiant and beautiful and powerful in all of that, they're able to see that in this moment. And this is the God that we serve. This is the God that we get a privilege of praying to as our Father. That is good news. Point of application. Get in position. Get in position. Peter um, and James and John had in the regular rhythm of their life obedience to God. It was not abnormal for them to walk with Jesus. It was not abnormal for them to pray with Jesus. And then they get this crazy opportunity to see God in all his glory, to see Jesus in his glorified state, shining bright above everything on a mountaintop. And these guys were simply walking and praying with Jesus, right? We can't conjure up a, a mountaintop experience. Today, Kelly, you can't go home and say, all right, God, it's time. I'm ready for the glory. And then just wait for God to shine down you. Like, have you ever had, let me, let me backtrack. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience with God? Believer, raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Have you ever had a moment where you knew that God just, he did something different. He answered a big prayer. He spoke to you in a way that changed your heart. You saw him in a way that made you love him more. You saw him in a way that changed the way that you think. Have you ever had a mountaintop experience with the Lord? All five of us, woo, all right, that's great. Yeah, the mountaintop experiences, we cannot conjure these up, but we certainly can position ourselves to be the recipient of God's glory. That it may not be you deciding to do something that allows him to show you his glory, like putting a quarter into a slot and expecting to turn the thing and get a gumball. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being in a spot where you are ready to receive a mountaintop experience with the Lord. He decides when it happens. He orchestrates the entire thing. However, oftentimes... We have the responsibility of positioning ourselves to be in that spot. For me, personally, this, is generally, this generally happens when I get alone and I get quiet. When I just get alone and I get quiet, and some of you are saying, I've got kids under three, all right? I understand that can be a chore, but finding a time where we can just get alone and get quiet and where God can speak to your soul so that you can see him in all his glory and in a fresh way, positioning yourself to be the recipient of that. And if God decides to throw you a curveball and just throw you an opportunity for you to see him in all his glory, that's great. But what if we positioned ourselves and were able to encounter him more? 2 Corinthians 3:16 through 18 says it this way. And we're going to walk through this verse together. So I'm glad it's actually up there in this service. Last time they made me get all the way through it and I realized nobody can see the verse. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 and following. When one turns to the Lord, so we see uh, the moment of salvation. So somebody has turned to the Lord. The veil is removed. The veil is removed. That means before we were saved, there was a veil over our eyes from seeing God in all his glory. That you may have had moments, but it wasn't a regular occurrence of seeing God in all his glory. Can anybody attest to that? Like before you were a believer, it's really hard to experience the Lord. But afterwards, it's like, wow, this is kind of a regular occurrence in my life of seeing God high and lifted up. 
In verse 17, now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Right? So what he's saying is we as believers all have an unveiled face. Before everything about God seemed cloudy, it was hard to put together. As we walk with the Lord, there are seasons where things are kind of hard to put together, what's going on or who God is in our circumstances. But as a believer, we have an unveiled face. There is nothing covering our face from experiencing the Lord. And when we see God in all his glory, when he, when we do exactly what the text says, beholding the glory of the Lord, when we behold God, when we look at him, when we desire to experience him, when we desire to receive from him, when we desire to see him high and lifted up, that's when true lasting transformation happens. And he says that he transforms us from one glory to the next. That means, Phil, when you got, can I pick on you for a minute? When you got saved, you were one glory, right? Before then, you're probably not very glorious. But then you, sorry, I don't know, Phil, before you got saved. But then you got to a point where God uh, begins to work in your life and there is one glory. And then you began to seek him and maybe six months later, there's like, man, there's things that are changing and he's cleaning me up and he's changing me. And then two years in, there's like another glory that's revealed. And I'm like, wow, I am being changed. And the reason that you're changing, um, I, I am, the reason you're changing, Phil, just so you know, is because you beheld God. It was not because you worked for it. Right? We get this so messed up. We think we have to achieve life transformation. We think we need to be good enough. We think we need to have a high enough level of understanding. We think we need to move the, the, uh, the chains forward so that God will actually bless us and we will see him more and, and we will experience him, we'll please him more. And if we please him, then we're a good little Christian. And we begin to clean things up. Begin to clean up the outside of us. Right? This is a... Uh, 2 Corinthians is alluding to, back in the Old Testament, Exodus 34, 35, Moses would go out and he would meet in a special tent with the Lord. And when he came out of the tent, this is Old Testament, it said that Moses' face shone. So his whole countenance was transformed because he met with the Lord. He was meeting with the glory of God in a tent and his whole countenance was changed to the point where everybody's like, Mo, you're glowing, put on a veil. And so Mo would put on a veil. Now, one of the commentators about that said it best when he said, for Moses, transformation was skin deep. For us in the New Testament, now, ours is from the heart out, from the mind out, from the inside out. That's how God changes us. Uh, so, sorry, 80s, 90s reference for y'all. Has anybody ever seen a glamour shot? Anybody know what Glamour Shots is? Okay, Google it. There's actually a lot of really funny Glamour Shots out there. But Glamour Shops was a shop that would, uh, Glamour Shots was a shop that would be set up. And you would go in and you would get pictures from the waist up. And these would generally be like pouty lips. And, and everybody, would, everybody had big hair. That was the thing about Glamour Shots. Is you had your hair big and a lot of hairspray. And then you would give this to somebody that you liked, a Glamour Shot. Right? It was all on the outside. For Moses, his transformation was, it was from 1988. I apologize. Some of you are a little bit younger than that. Uh, but his outside appearance was like a glamour shot. What made him fancy was they were one of the only places at that time that were using filters so that they would filter out all of the imperfections. We can see our walk with Jesus as us filtering out all of our imperfections and working, working, working to try to filter out all our imperfections or we can biblically do what 2 Corinthians uh, 3.18 says, we can behold the Lord. We can behold the glory of the Lord. We can seek an intimate relationship with him and invite him to show us himself. And when we do that, we are changed from one glory 
to another. It's biblical, spiritual growth. It's not centered around do, do, do. It's centered around be, be, be. Behold, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are then changed. We are then transformed. Many get so exhausted trying to change themselves, right? Change their uh, spiritual maturity level and attain something. And yet at the end of the day, it is beholding God that does the absolute work in our hearts. Matthew chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. And behold, there appeared to Moses and there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So uh, we see that in this scene. So again, on a mountaintop, they are praying. They've just been startled out of praying. Uh, because of the bright light and because when they look up, they notice that there is Moses and Elijah that are talking with Jesus. Immediately, my mind goes to, what were they talking about? Wouldn't that be great if we were fly on the wall and knew what Jesus was talking to Moses and Elijah about? Now, remember, Old Testament, Elijah goes to be with the Lord, actually doesn't experience a physical death, just gets on a chariot and goes to be with the Lord. Moses did die a physical death, and then he went to be with the Lord. So this is a long time before this scene is taking place. They've been dead for a long time. Luke chapter 9, verse 30 and 31 actually tells us, uh, actually tells us what was going on. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, just like Matthew talked about, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which, was about, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So these guys are having a chat with Jesus, and Mo Mo and Eli are just hanging out with Jesus, chatting with Jesus. When the disciples look up, and they're like, "Oh my!" You ever do one of those where you're praying and you sort of you look, check on your kids, make sure nobody's eating their food, right? They they sort of look up and they see this bright light, and they're like, "What is going on?" And then these guys are standing there. They are talking with Jesus about what is about to happen to Jesus. I can imagine, in my mind, Jesus saying. What does death feel like? And Eli's like, I don't know. Not really sure. I just sort of ended up in heaven on a chariot of fire. And Mo's like, look at me now. Look at me now. I'm in heaven. How many of you all have lost somebody that you absolutely loved and adored and that meant just a ton to you? If they knew Jesus, they're in heaven just like these guys, right? So Jesus is having this conversation. It's sort of like the fifth inning of a baseball game. You know, the coach wanders out. He's spitting and he's wandering out to the, to the middle of the field. And then the catcher comes in and then the pitcher's talking with his glove in front of his mouth. The catcher's talking with his glove in front of his mouth. Jesus is having this conversation uh, with them. And then Peter, oh my goodness, this guy. So uh, Peter's phenomenal because he shows us generally what not to do. That's what I love about Peter. He's got a big mouth. So Peter is so awestruck by this moment of, wow, Jesus is transfigured, fully changing right in front of us. He's so overwhelmed. He just blurts out, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Jesus doesn't even like bite. He just blurts out this, well, what in the world is Peter talking about? Peter thought he answered the question right that he had on his mind. None of the, right? James and John are there and they're like, they're just awestruck. And Peter's like, somebody say something. And so he blurts out, see Zechariah chapter 14, uh, verse 16, he prophesies that there will be this continual feast of booths. If you have a different version of the Bible, it may actually translate tents as booths. We're going to put that together. Everybody's really confused right now. It's okay. In the Old Testament, they had this feast of booths. It was a feast that they do during the harvest season. Now, if you've ever traveled into a heavily Jewish populated area, you'll notice this week because people will build little booths in their front yard, even to this day. 
And the goal is to spend as much time in there for a week as you can and just enjoy the time eating and drinking and reminiscing together about the good of the Lord and how much that he has provided for you. This was also something that the people of God did, um, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 4, that the people of God did year after year and were sanctioned to do year after year to remember the exodus, that the exodus happened and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and the soles of their shoes were not even wore out in that 40 years, that God had provided for them even in their 40 years of wandering, wandering and even in their 40 years of disobedience, God had provided to them. So uh, we know that when God's kingdom comes because of the prophecies, it will be as if there is a feast of booths that is happening regular even in the new kingdom that comes down. And so Peter's like, I'll build a booth. I'll build three, Jesus. Now, what he didn't do was that he didn't say, Jesus, I'm going to build you the biggest booth and I'm going to build those other guys little ones. Jesus sees everybody in the glorified body and puts Jesus in the same line as Elijah and Mo. So instead of seeing Jesus glorified and giving him more honor, he actually lowers it as he blurts this out. Peter's also implying that he wants them to live with him on the mountain forever. He doesn't want to leave that mountaintop experience, right? How do we apply this? This is a glimpse of your resurrection. This is the shortest point of the day, right? Just Mo and Eli were fully there, fully coherent, fully recognizable post-death. So will you and I be as believers in Jesus Christ. This is good news. Romans chapter 6, verse 5 says, for if we have been united with him in a, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. First John 3, 2, beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In essence, this mountaintop scene where these guys are seeing uh, Moses and Elijah uh, in their glorified form, and we are seeing Jesus high and lifted up. This is a trailer for the coming attraction that will be the end of our lives. That is good news for the believer. There never needs to be a fear of death in us because we've already had the previews. We've already seen the trailers. We already know what's coming just as Jesus was raised to his glorified body, just as we see Moses and Elijah in a glorified state and still can recognize them. As we see that happening, it's a preview of what will happen to you and I. We will resurrect one day. This is good news to the believer in Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So Peter's still blurting out. He's still speaking. <laughs> and behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Peter just couldn't shut his mouth. So the father steps in. He overshadows in what? A bright cloud. If you're somebody that enjoys Old Testament studies, you may have heard of the Shekinah glory, the glory of God, this bright light. Again, again, a nod to the Exodus. Because as the people of God came out of Egypt, God led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So there was this cloud, this bright cloud, and they knew that the presence of God, God in all his glory, was leading the Israelites through the wilderness. It was a visible representation of God's presence. His presence was always in front of them, so he knew, they knew that he was there. And, G and God the Father says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. 
It is as if in this moment, the father just gives one more affirmation, Jesus, this is my son. I want you guys to know this. Jesus, this is my son, and he brings me pleasure. You ever have a parent that just spoke a word that you needed to hear about how proud they were of you? Or maybe it was a coach, or maybe it was a friend. This was that moment where the father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You remember how that made you feel when somebody said something great about you? You ever have somebody say something horrible about you and cut you? The father doesn't do that to the son. And the great news is that God is as well pleased in you as he was with Jesus. That's how we apply this. Jesus' death on the cross, there was this big exchange that happened that the father no longer has to worry about his wrath or his anger towards our sin because it is paid. So all the father has left to give is love. So just as the father was well pleased in Jesus, he is well pleased in you. I realize we all came in here and we all came in here as people that probably have some area of brokenness that we're dealing with. That we all came in here and we had some area where we just feel inept as a believer. And we just feel like we don't measure up. And the good news of what the gospel does, because Jesus' offering was so sufficient, we are now launched into a spot of being continually in God's favor. That's good news. That means you don't have to earn God's favor. It is something freely given that you just partake in. It is a gift that you can choose to open or choose to remain ignorant of what's in it. But he has favor available as a son through Jesus. Spurgeon says it this way. God is so boundlessly... Uh, is so boundlessly pleased with Jesus that in him he is altogether pleased with us. Jesus, God the Father was so pleased with the life that Jesus lived and the obedience that he lived with that it now overshadows by faith your uh, particular sin patterns, that it overshadows your shortcomings, that those things that you feel like you just don't measure up in, I get it. I'm a little shorter than the average bear, right? I don't feel like I measure up with a lot of people, right? But at the end of the day, Jesus doesn't care about any of that. The Father doesn't care about any of that. He chose you because of his grace and his mercy, not because you are the best uh, this or the best that, or you have this gifting or that gifting, Anything you have, he gave to you. There's this uh, word that we use uh, or that the scriptures use. It's called propitiation. Let me get to it here. The slides, for some reason, are not in order this morning. Somehow it resets. Anyways, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. And th there's this, this word that we're going to read, and we're going to talk about it for just a minute here. Humor me. He is the propitiation. This is Jesus. He is the propitiation. If you don't know what that word is, don't worry. Um, I didn't know for a long time either for, it's not a word you use a lot, like, you know, don't propitiate all of the cereal or, you know, I don't know, but it's just not a word we use. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. A couple other verses mention that in the new Testament, this word propitiation, let's try to pronounce it together. Propitiation. All right. That was weak. All right. Propitiation. All right. There we go. This means it's two different sides of the same theological coin. On one side, it means there is a payment in full that has been received, okay? So this means that when Jesus died on a cross, hallelujah, the Father said, that is a payment in full that I will receive. So your sin fine was paid for on the cross, and the asterisk was next to it when he rose from the dead. That's good news, right? The other side of it is you now have a new benefit package as a believer in Jesus Christ because of it. That means we receive a new position 
all that's left that the father has to give is love because the sin debt has been paid. And this verse is the best one for this point because not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world that has been done. So this is a payment in full, and also we receive a new benefit package. So it's a a payment in full. Your sin debt has been paid. That is a dollar sign, and this is a gift. Uh, There we go. There we go. Dude, there's a gift. So propitiation. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the full payment, and yet because that full payment was done, you now have a new benefit package as a child of God. Here's one way that John Murray says it, and I think this is really good. It's kind of a long quote. I apologize. But he says, the doctrine of propitiation is precisely this, that God loved the objects of his wrath, the world, so much that he gave his own son to the end that he, by his blood, should make provision for the removal of his wrath. It was Christ's, so to deal with the wrath that the love that the loved would no longer be the objects of wrath, but the love would achieve its aim in making the children of wrath the children of God's good pleasure. All right, let me, let me bring that down a little bit. Just a little bit, a little bit. We'll put the cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can reach them. Here's what that means. That means that because of what Jesus did on the cross, you all deserve an equal share of your sin being dealt with and you being able to live in the blessings and in, in, in the, um, the fullness of the benefit package of being a child of God. And we must fight for this, believers, because everything in you says you're not worthy. There are some of you that you wake up and you, some of you are arrogant and you think you are worthy, but we'll deal with that another week. But some <laughs> believers wake up and they don't realize how worthy that they've been made. They feel unworthy. They feel like they can't attain. They feel like they're not good enough. They feel like they're not smart enough. They feel like they just don't get it. They feel like they're trying these spiritual things and it's just not working. And that's the devil's way of keeping you down. And yet the word of God is very clear that all that has been dealt with and you can walk in the blessings of God for one reason alone. You've been chosen. So when you feel unworthy, throw the word chosen back at that. When you feel like a failure, throw the word chosen back at that. That's how we deal with it, folks. You have been chosen by God. There's an example. When Molly and I adopted a couple kids back in the day, each one of the kids came with this black book. And in this black book were all their medical records, were all their achievements in school. There were like things to put up on the fridge right away. We had all of their biological parents' information. We had all this stuff. And there was this black book, and you sort of read through this black book, and, and, and it, it allowed us to kind of understand what we were getting into, most of what we were getting into. And uh, we looked at that, and then we chose to adopt our kids. Praise the Lord. It's awesome. So we were able to see this black book. Essentially, what the gospel is, is God knew your black book, all of it, nothing hidden, and yet he chose you, which means you are never a failure in God's eyes, which means you are never going to receive the wrath of God because Jesus already covered that. Amen? Amen. This is good news that he chose you before the foundations of the world were laid. He knew what your book said, and he chose you. The, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm too weak in my faith. When all that creeps in your mind, you've got to rewrite that because you are a chosen and blood-bought child of a king. And you've got to rewrite some of that because some of you are living in failure. And I realize that, you know, when I make these points, it may not apply to everybody. There's a lot of people that applies to. And you're stuck in a rut because you feel like you can't get out. And yet, at the same time, God is like, "Mm, dealt with. Chosen. Last point. Let our worship be like this. Band's going to make their way up. We're going to close in one more with one more song. But let our worship be like this. Here's what scriptures say. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Verse 7. We're in Matthew 17. But Jesus came and touched them, saying... Rise and have no fear. 
You see, if you today, the glory of God were to descend on us, we would have no choice but to kneel. We would have no choice but to shudder and shake. And, and that's just reality. There's not a lot of times where God shows up in the scriptures and that doesn't happen. Right? When God shows up, there's a little bit of fear and trepidation there. There is an awe that's overwhelming and almost scary. God is untamable. And yet in the untamableness, I'm going to use your shoulder, Jacob. Jesus comes and what does he do to the disciples? They're on the ground terrified and he puts his hand on them. And what does he say? Rise and have no fear. That's worship. That we have this untamable, holy, perfect God that can overshadow us and knock us down in a minute. And yet in the midst of that, the gospel says that Jesus comes in. He appeases any of the wrath or worry of the fear uh, that we may have that is unhealthy fear. And he puts his hand on your shoulder and he says, you are my child. Hi, Jacob. You're not my child. Uh, I'd adopt you if I had an opportunity. You, you all want to stand as we close with one more worship song. So I don't know what truth it is in the scriptures that we looked at um, that maybe stuck out to you. Maybe it was just the clarity of the gospel. Maybe it was just a fresh awe in worship that we're supposed to have. Maybe it's knowing that you are chosen and that God doesn't look at you with anger and regret for adopting you as his child, but he looks at you with love. Or maybe it's knowing that your resurrection is set and you don't have to live in fear any longer. But however God moves you to respond, my encouragement would be to do that. If that means you stand there and you just listen as other people sing and you have a moment with the Lord, or if that means you sing along and you praise the God that is worth it, uh, then you do that with all your heart.
Thank you uh, that you are willing to let us know you and show yourself to us. And I pray that we would just really want to see you clearly, to have our eyes open, and to really believe who you are. And Lord, I think of in the book of Jeremiah, you told your people, don't boast in being wise, don't boast in being powerful, don't boast in being rich, but boast that you know me. And so, God, I pray that that would be this church, that more than anything else, we would be proud of the fact that we can know you face-to-face and personally. And so, Lord, I pray for anyone in the room that does not know you, that they would come to experience you and put their faith in you for the first time even today. And so, God, we just thank you for all you're doing here, and we pray 